greetings in the name of Jesus this morning. It is uh, good to be in the house of God again. When Kendall was praying, I thought about a little church in Whitmarsham, uh, the Netherlands, and it was a Mennonite church, I believe, uh, and on the front it said in German, and I just translate here, hear God's word, believe God's word, obey God's word. And I think we're here for the purpose of hearing God's word and believing God's word, but the devils also believe and tremble. But to obey God's word is our final, uh, what we really want to follow through on. And when we do that, we find peace and joy and rest. This morning, I would like to actually bring you a message that basically I heard this message two weeks ago, and I heard it in German. And the person who, who preached the message translated it into English and gave us copies. So I'm basically going to adapt this sermon uh, to how I understood it. And the, the title I'm going to give it is Matters of the Heart. So you'll know why the title a little bit later maybe. So I'd like to think for, uh, for us to spend some time in the beginning thinking about and considering the topic of talking talking or communication. So what's so special about the idea of talking? The topic of talking. Talking is an everyday thing that we engage in many times during the day. It's something that we do almost without thinking, to our detriment sometimes, if we do talking without thinking. Most times we consider it harmless and normal. Maybe that's why we should think and consider more about what actually happens and what we do all day long as we talk to our acquaintances, our friends, and our neighbors. The truth is, there are a few things that we do more often than talking or communicating. And there are hardly any things that are more important than the need to communicate or talk. What if you couldn't communicate? If you happen to be deaf, and you can't hear, and that means you can't know how to speak either. People find ways of communicating with, with sign language. That is one of the basic needs that we have. What would our world look like if we couldn't all talk to each other? Would life even be worth living? So let's explore a little bit more. What actually happens when we talk to each other? Luke chapter 6, verse 43 to 45. I'd like to read that. I'd like for you to stand for the reading of the word. Luke chapter 43, 6, verse 43 to 45 says, For a good tree bringeth forth, bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush do men gather grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. You may be seated. The last phrase, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, is one that should stick with us. Jesus puts it in very simple words. He just says, simply, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, what the heart is full of comes out through our talking, through our way of communication. It's not a new thought. Both believers and unbelievers, children and adults, know this truth, that whatever the heart's full of, it comes out. 
What is inside us comes out. James, the brother of John, of Jesus, wrote that our tongue is an unruly evil. It's full of deadly poison. He goes on to say, James says, when we have bitter envying and self-seeking in our hearts, we must not lie or boast about the truth or boast about ourselves, but admit that envy and selfishness of our hearts is what causes confusion and all kinds of evil. This again reminds us that it is a heart problem that we have. Many times we want to blame other things for our problems. So what happens when we talk to each other? The answer is fairly clear. When we talk to each other, we actually reveal to each other what's in our heart. In other words, people can see what is inside of us when we talk to each other. I could give you example after example of how people can see what's inside you when we talk, the words that come out of our mouth. There are lots of courses on communication available to us today. Most of those courses focus on ways that we can become better communicators. How can I improve myself, my professional life, my love relationship? How can I improve my dealings with my children? Uh, how can I improve how I deal with conflict? Th those are ways that we, we want to improve. There's all kinds of, of communication programs out there. But communication is actually a matter of the heart. I hope you don't think I'm repeating myself too many times here. The exciting thing this morning, though, is that our Lord Jesus goes to the very source of where all problems and difficulties arise. He goes to the heart. So this morning, what we focus on will be more about the heart than about our speech and our tongue. Jesus has a brilliant teaching for us that, for us that will affect how we communicate. We would all agree that we've heard many words of encouragement. We. Have you heard words of encouragement in your life? I think you have. Uh, you've heard words of kindness. You've heard love, love and words that give us strength. We can remember many helpful conversations. But what really haunts us many times are the conversations that have hurt us, the conversations that have caused damage, the quarrels that we might have had. Those are the, those are the memories that we have that haunt us. They cause heartache and a lot of evil. So think back over this last week. How was your speech? With your spouse, with your children, with your colleagues, with your classmates? How was your speech with your neighbors, with your friends? How was your speech with the people that you might find unsympathetic, with the people who make your life difficult? How was your speech with the people who ignore you, don't greet you, or just plain don't like you? How was your speech with the people who were unkind to you? How were, was your speech with the people who disagree with your opinion? But really, how was your speech not with those people, but about those people? I mean, that's where it really starts hitting. How was your speech about those people? It is very much in our best interest to understand the truth that Jesus is trying to get across to us. This is a solution to many of our everyday problems. Here, in understanding the truth that Jesus is trying to tell us, we find sustainable life change. Going back to the heart problem, Jesus teaches us that if we want to improve our communication, we must talk about our hearts. Start doing some introspection. When we talk, we do nothing but express our thoughts 
our desires, our goals, our true feelings. With our words, we're actually trying to achieve the goals of our hearts. Do you all have goals? I think we all do. And with our speech, many times we're trying to achieve the goals of our hearts. If we understand this and are honest with ourselves, we can actually judge ourselves. We can actually look at ourselves and say, oh, okay, there's a problem there. James was talking about that. He said that if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Just acknowledge the truth. And then you can start. That's the place that we need to start from. If we, uh, if we have a bad heart, it comes out through our speech. If we have a good heart, it will also come out through our speech. You don't get grapes from a thorn bush. Let's take a look at two other persons before we get back to ourselves. First person. Probably don't think of this. Let's think of God. Genesis 1, 27 says this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he man. Did you know that each of you are created in the image and likeness of God? Male and female, he created them. We're all made of the same stuff. Then he says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful. When God said that, he was revealing his own heart for us. God blessed them and, he's, and he wanted us to be fruitful. God is revealing the, the desires of his heart for mankind whether we follow those desires is your call. This describes what happens the moment when God created man. He begins to talk to man. He blesses them. He, this means he gives them his love and affection and everything that's good for their lives. This is the way that God still speaks to us. He speaks to us through his living word. What does God say to us about his word in, in his word? Many, many things. The word of God reveals to us what his deepest thoughts and desires are for us. When? When we let the word of God speak into our hearts and we start thinking the thoughts that God has in his heart about us, we find our hearts being changed. The results are out of this world. They're heartwarming. They're peaceful. The results, I could go on and on with the results. I could ask you what the results are when you begin listening to God and what his word is to you. Now, second person. You can probably guess by now. Satan. And his first words to us. Genesis 3, verse 1. <clears throat> now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said? Immediately, Satan comes in. It's not his desire to bless us. It's his desire to get us to question whether God is good. Satan wants us to question whether God is actually good. He is against God. He contradicts God. He also tries to move people to rebellion against God. Whenever he speaks the harmonious whenever he speaks the harmonious communication between God and man is disturbed. It's destroyed actually whenever we listen. The devil also speaks from what is in his heart. He encourages Eve to bring uh, to cultivate and pursue other desires than what God intended for her. That is actually what brought Eve down. She listened to those desires. From now on, Adam and Eve and all of mankind's bent is not toward God, but it's away from God. Satan fights against God's power and dominion. He contradicts God and works against him. 
are we able to identify those times? I think it's highly important for us to learn to identify the times when Satan is inciting us against God. Yea, hath God said, do you really need to do this? Satan wants to stop us to stop acknowledging God as ruler and Lord of our lives. Satan wants to dethrone God from being Lord of our lives. Now, back to ourselves. Our conflict, our problem, is not so much with getting our words right. So sometimes we think, oh, if I just have said the right words. Our problem is with getting our hearts right. Because from out of our heart, the mouth speaks. Our problem is the same as Adam and Eve's problem. Who are we going to allow to sit on the throne of our hearts? Is it, will it be the big I? Or will it be God? Will it be my ego that's more important? Or is it God who is more important? We will ch either choose God's love or self-love and self-domination. This is where the evil heart and the good heart differ from each other. There's the evil heart and there's the good heart. No, so what does this have to do with communication? What does this have to do with talking with each other? It has everything to do with our communication and speaking with each other. Because when we speak, we are literally communicating to others what our heart is full of. It is in our hearts that the final fate of our speech is determined. It is in our hearts that the real causes of communication problems come from. Our hearts determine the aim and the goal of the words that we speak. So now it's time for us to examine our hearts. I know that next Sunday we're to have an examination service, a preparatory service before communion. I, is that right, more or less? Friday evening, sorry, Friday evening, yes. And so, so that's, maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but that's our responsibility, to examine our hearts. Have you or I ever done something that we really knew deep down in our heart that God would be displeased about? Have you or I ever thought to ourselves, just this once, I'm going to do this thing because it just suits me better. I don't really care what God or anyone else thinks. What do you or I really think about life and the daily decisions that we make? Many of the problems, many of the problems that we experience when we talk to each other arise from the fact that we no longer submit to the authority of God. We say what we want. We say it when we want, and we say how we want to say it. We speak in order to pursue our own goals and not the goals of God's will. We put I on the throne of our heart. We must examine ourselves. Are we pursuing our, sel our selfish goals or God's will? This may seem like a small thing, but our biggest problem is usually not the choice of our words or the tone of our voice, but our biggest problem is the way that we look at life. Our way of looking at life is not the way God looks at life. Isaiah, or somewhere back there, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so much higher are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That is a truth and a fact that we have to acknowledge. So that's why we need God in our lives, because we need to have him be the very center of our heart. And then from out of the, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When we do, when we enthrone ourselves, we embark on the same path that the cunning serpent Satan did. We start talking in the same way with demanding and pretending and twisting and manipulating. It becomes a vicious circle and we even start blaming God and each other as Adam and Eve did. 
We do the same thing today, sad and sorry to say. It's the driver's fault in front of me. My wife or my husband or my children, they just make me mad. The teacher's unfair. The neighbor's just malicious. The boss is so bossy. Yeah, all those things. We're blaming somebody else. But really, we should never do that. We still have problems of blaming everything and everybody around me. The truth is, we are indirectly addressing the sovereign God. Think about it. Adam and Eve, when they blamed the serpent, when they blamed each other, they were indirectly blaming God. You made me this way. We could go over that some more and more. God holds everything in his hands. The real problem lies in our hearts. James 4 verse 1 says, Where do wars and fighting come from, come, from, come from among you? Do those wars and fights not come from your desire for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust, you do not have. You murder and covet, you cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Our lusts cause us to quarrel. The problem lies deep in our own hearts. Our lusts begin ma playing a major role in our lives. Our problem isn't that we can't find the right words. Our problem isn't that we're in the wrong situation or with the wrong people. When our lusts rule us, everything around us needs to be adjusted to satisfy those lusts. Eve saw and found out that the fruit tasted good. But what she realized later was that the fruit was not good for her. The fruit might taste good. There's a lot of things that taste good, but they're not necessarily good for you. Dear brothers and sisters, all the circumstances of our lives are only occasions for expressing who or what occupies my heart. In our everyday lives, our words reveal our problems in our hearts. Our surrounding people and situations are not the cause of what we say, but only an opportunity for our mouth to put into words what our heart desires actually are. What emerges is that which really dominates my heart. Love for myself or love for others. Or for God, my neighbor. I think this is the moment at which we will struggle with the topic to a certain extent. So now your thoughts might be going, are we not allowed to have any more wishes, any more desires, any more dreams, any more goals? What about those things that challenge us in everyday life? I mean, can we not be ourselves a little bit? And maybe we'll try to answer the question a little bit. What I speak has a direct connection to what I want in my heart. According to what James says here, strife arises from desires. He doesn't say it's wrong to have desires. And we all know this. A person without wishes, without desires, is dead. There's nothing there. The problem here is not simply evil wishes. The problem is when our desires want to become God, want to become big, and make a claim and power on us. James says, there's actually the lusts in us actually fight within our members. So the desires begin to fight for space in the heart. And then also the desires fight for space in our environment. Then when something gets in the way of my heart's desires, they try to push forward and make room. My heart's desires try to get, in, in, because you know we, we want to be something. 
And here it depends on who sits on the throne of our hearts. Who sits on the throne of their hearts. It is, if it's the ego, we will fight for our desires and, des and, and our, our wishes and our wants. Of course, those desires are occupying the place of supremacy. That's the main, that they're, they're occupying the place of, of supremacy in our heart. Where? Who actually deserves that place of supremacy in our hearts? God. He deserves that place of supremacy. The fight is, just, is not just an interpersonal dispute. Above all, it is the following problem of the heart. We practice idolatry. We ourselves sit on the throne, and God and the world are to worship us. We begin to make demands of people and God. Instead of serving God and others, God and man are now to serve us in our pleasures. That's a problem with desires. They have a tendency to rise to a position they should never get into. Our desires are there for a reason. I mean, I just a little bit ago had a desire for a drink because it was my tongue was my mouth was getting dry. So there's a purpose and a reason for that. But they should never get to rule us to the point where, uh, where everybody else suffers. The greater the power of the desire, the stronger our readiness to fight. The harder the means we reach for. You know that when people are addicted to drink or drugs or whatever, they will get do everything to the point of even robbing and killing in order to satisfy that desire. That is a desire out of control. But again, the big problem lies in our hearts. When we mis but we misuse our words to serve our problem. Ultimately, everything should serve our ego. ego. We want to make our lifelong dreams come true. Communication fails the most when what we love the most is attacked. And then, when there are problems, we blame other people and situations. But in the end, who are we blaming? Indirectly? Yeah. We're blaming God. Just as Adam did when he gave place and power to his desires because we are dissatisfied with the situation in which God has placed us. So here's a personal question. When your speech is problematic, do you tend to blame it on certain, certain circumstances? You're out on the road. You're blaming it on road transport. You might be blaming it on a negative skill that you might have. We might, you might be blaming your problems on an unfavorable financial situation. You might blame your problems on bad weather, on problems with the car, problems at work, major family challenges. We have all kinds of things to blame our problems on. Do you tend, do I tend, to blame people for communication problems? My wife, my husband, my children, my parents, my boss, my teacher, and on and on and on. Do we tend to indirectly accuse God by saying, if only I had more money, if only I had a different wife, if only I had a better friends, if only I, and the list goes on, had this or that, then I wouldn't react the way I react. There wouldn't be any problems. Is that the truth? No, it's not the truth. The truth is that we need to understand this, and then that's the first step in the healing direction if I register this truth. Jesus tells us what comes out of your mouth is a matter of the heart. And in James we read that strife is the problem of a false rule on the throne of our hearts. Perhaps we simply have a false expectation of life. God is not there to serve us on our wrong path. God is is not there to serve us on a wrong path. He's not there to fulfill everything we want. Sometimes we, because of our wrong thoughts, we change and whenever we are parents, then we try to fulfill everything our children want and we don't even understand. Our, our whole thought process is wrong and we do things that are that are against what God, the way God would do it. God wants us, wants to put us on the right path. And our everyday challenges 
are, our everyday palette challenges are the perfect opportunity for the truth about our hearts to come to light so that we can understand what's going on. You may have been praying for change in some area of your life for years. Nothing happens. Perhaps this is exactly what God wants to achieve, a change of dominion in the throne of your heart. The desires of our ego with their claim to power must be eliminated and it must be made so that God can be ruling in your heart again. Love for ourselves will drive us to want to abuse God and our fellow human beings. This is the fruit of our heart and it's the real reason for communication problems. So James, coming back to James again, James is the Lord's brother, and he wrote many good things. He says, James 4, 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Make a change of dominion when you find that God is no longer on the throne. There are times when you're going along and God is on the throne of your hearts. But then there are times when you discover, oh, God is not on the throne. At that point, you need to put back God back on the throne. What then? Because does God have for us? God pursues deeper goals for us than just getting out of bed in the morning with a smile. God pursues deeper goals for us than just a satisfying work, romantic weekends with my wife, although those are fun, uh, encouraging friendships, well-behaved children, his desire for us is more than just a beautiful house and good surroundings. It's more than a financial plan that works well. God is even willing to risk not giving us those things in order to bring about something bigger, fuller, deeper, a sincere faith. What God really wants is to us to have a sincere faith, a heart that is completely attached to him and not to any of its own desires. This is what Peter describes. 1 Peter 1, 6-7. He said, Then you who are now, for a short time, if need be, grieving in various trials, so that the test of your faith, which is more precious than the perishable gold, which is tried by fire, may result in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. If we would never have any trials, then our faith would never be tested. Then, in the end, we'd just be like, a worldly person that never, that everything goes perfectly well, and David describes that person and says, he's just looking at this person, nothing ever goes wrong with him, but then he knows their end, and he realizes that those people have nothing in the end, nothing solid to rest their faith on. God has another goal. His main goal for us is love. I mean, our Sunday school was perfect. What is the main goal for God, for us as a church, for God? What does he want for us? He wants us to love each other. He wants us to care about each other. He wants us to live out his commandments for each other. Matthew 22, 37 to 40, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. These are God's great goals for us. First of all, for me and my heart. Second of all, for the church. Because as we all come together, that's the goal. When we come to God, when we came to God, we sought deliverance from sin and the bondage of Satan. It was still very much about ourselves. How many of you came to God because you had a big problem? You wanted deliverance from sin and Satan. It's a little bit more than that. Now God wants to educate our hearts more and more to selfless love for God and our fellow man. This is what he achieves when we come into conflict and find that our ego is on the throne. There, then it is the opportunity to cling to God more than before. This brings forth more love for God and more love for our neighbor. Another one of God's goals is our sanctification. It is also valuable to recognize that our circumstances are an essential means by which God brings forth what he has ordained for our lives that we may be transformed into the image of, your son, of his son. Romans 8, 28. And we know 
that all things work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. All things that work together for good are not just for our pleasure, for our goodness, but they are meant to conform us to the image of the son of God himself. Those things that happen to us. Is what's happening to you conforming you to the image of the Son of God? That's a question. And I think many times it is in this congregation. We may pursue a day's success, and then we grumble and get frustrated with problems with objects, the slow computer, problems with people, situations. But God is concerned with the process of making me holy, the image of his Son making me holy. Paul also has this goal. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 to 20. Of course, if Paul is following God, then he has the same goals God has. So, And therefore he, Jesus, died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Thus we are ambassadors for Christ in such a way that God himself exhorts through us so let us now pray on behalf of Christ. Be ye reconciled to God. That is Paul's desire. Be ye reconciled to God. In other words, you're reconciled means that you, you're walking in the same harmony with God. And that's reconciliation. In this way, God completes his saving work in us through the challenges of everyday life. Thus, our prayer to God becomes less and less a list of demands in the form of prayer requests, but more and more expressions of gratitude and adoration. So our conversation with people becomes a transmission of the gospel. Our conversation, our, our communication with people becomes a transmission, transmitting the good news. Yes, last Sunday we heard what the gospel is. Well, our speech is meant to transmit the gospel, not just to me, myself, and I, but to those around me, so that it grows and something good happens. I think I should just bring this to a close. I'm over my time. Of uh, Maybe I'd like to read one more thing to you that struck me uh, this week. <clears throat> it was May 21st, 1946. The place, Los Alamos. A young and daring scientist was carrying out a necessary experiment in preparation for the atomic test to be conducted in the waters of the South Pacific. He had successfully performed such an experiment in preparation uh, many times before. In his effort to determine the amount of uranium, U-235, necessary for a chain reactions, reaction, scientists call it the critical mass, he would push two hemispheres, now a hemisphere is a half of a ball, and he had two hemispheres of uranium, he pushed them together. Then, just as the mass became critical, he would take a screwdriver, push it apart with a screwdriver and instantly stop the chain reaction. If he let it there too long, there would be radiation resulting that would kill everyone in the room. That day, just as the material became critical, the screwdriver slipped. The hemispheres of uranium came too close together. Instantly, the room was filled with a dazzling bluish haze. Young Lewis Slotin, instead of ducking and thereby possibly saving himself, tore the two hemispheres apart with his hands and thus interrupted the chain reaction. By this instant, he saved the lives of seven other people in the room. As he waited for the car that was take them to, to take them to the hospital, he said quietly to his companion, you'll come through all right but I haven't the faintest chance myself. 
it was only too true. Nine days later, he died in the hospital in tremendous agony. Nineteen centuries ago, the Son of the Living God walked directly into sin's most concentrated radiation, allowing himself to be touched with its curse and let it take his life. But by that act, he broke the chain reaction. He broke the power of sin. He took the heat for you and I. Take that into your hearts. Remember what Jesus did for you. Remember what Jesus did for me. And that can change our heart reaction whenever we are going through hard times. We can put ourselves into that place. That young man lost his life, but he saved the lives of seven others. Jesus gave his life, and he saved, he had the potential of saving the whole world. Those who believe, hear God's word, believe God's word, obey God's word. Let's do that for our own lives today. Let's kneel for prayer. Thank you, Lord.